Well, good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me all right? Okay, very good. Violinist, I hope you're ready to open with prayer because the floor is yours. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Let's open up in, in prayer to start the study tonight, shall we? What it is, thank you for the time to gather with you and around your word tonight. I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to what you have to share with us tonight, and you would help us understand what you have brought to us tonight as we open your word and look together at what you have to share with us tonight. Thank you for Romans again to. Come and lead us another great installment on his, his Bible weekly Bible study. And I just ask that you would bless him and hopefully if, if it's your will, bring more people tonight to the study. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, and thank you for that. Violinist. And good evening, everyone. Before I begin, I want to remind those of you who are familiar with how I like to operate these uh, Bible studies. This is a discussion, not a lecture. Please feel free to both ask and answer questions, to, to contribute scriptures and comments. Uh, because this is not my time, this is our time, and we can all be blessed <clears throat> by each other, as I have in the past with you all, and as I hope you have been with me. So let's begin. We are continuing in our series, Christian Resolutions 2020, and our review and examination of love, the first fruit of the Spirit. Tonight, we continue to look at the aspect of love we started last week, namely, at the many facets of love as it was manifested by Christ. Tonight, I'm going to do something that I have only done once or twice before in the past 10 years here at the Four Gospels website. I'm going to provide a single verse and a single commentary on that verse. As I recall, Alexander McLaren was the source of the single commentary on the previous occasions, as he is also this evening. <clears throat> as I believe you will see, Alexander McLaren, like almost no one else I've used for commentaries, had the ability to draw so much out of a single verse. And it's all quite insightful and edifying. So let's get to the verse and be blessed by what he wrote. Now you may recognize a major theme in this verse as being reflected in the opening video that I chose. Well, the violinist says he was like Matthew Henry. He was like Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry was also very deeply insightful. But Alexander McLaren just had the ability to go in deeper, to a deeper level. That as good as Matthew Henry was, I think that he had just a slight, a slight edge on him where that's concerned. <clears throat> 
Jesus' love is expressed by his washing away our sins. As recorded in Revelation 1.5, quote, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And that was the major theme of the video, being washed in the blood. Of this, Alexander McLaren comments, a faithful witness is an eyewitness, and that is what Christ claims when he witnesses about God. We speak that we do know. We testify that we have seen. I speak that which I have seen with my father. There's nothing more remarkable about the oral portion of our Lord's witness than the absence of any appearance such as marks all the wisest words of great men of having come to them as a result of patient thought. We never seen him in the act of arriving at a truth, nor detect any traces of the process of forming opinions in him. He speaks as if he had seen, and his tone is that of one who is not thinking out truth or grasping at it, but simply narrating that which lies plain and clear ever before his eyes. I do not ask you what that involves, but I quote his own statement of what it involves. Quote, no man hath ascended up to heaven, save he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. <clears throat> there have been plenty of great and gracious words about God, and there have been plenty of, plenty of black and blasphemous thoughts of him. They rise in our own hearts, and they come from our brother's tongues. Many have worshipped God's gracious, God's loving, God's angry, God's petulant, God's capricious. But God, after the fashion of God whom Jesus Christ avouches to us, we have nowhere else a God of absolute truth who so loved the world, that is, you and me, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And now I ask, is there not grace and peace brought to us all from that faithful witness <coughs> and from his credible testimony? Surely the one thing that the world wants is to have the question answered whether there really is a God in heaven that cares anything about me and to whom I can trust myself wholly. And under his wings, writes, my body is aching too much to focus on listening. Well, I'm sorry to hear that under his wings. <clears throat> Believing that he will lift me out of all my meanness and sins and make me clean and pure and blessed like himself. Surely that is the deepest of all human needs, howsoever little men may know it. And I am sure that none of us can find the certitude of such a father unless we give credence to the message of Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> This day needs that witness as much as any other. 
Sometimes in our unbelieving moments, we think more than any other. There is a wave, I believe it's only a wave, passing over the cultivated thought of Europe at present, which will make short work of all belief in a God that does not grip fast to Jesus Christ. As far as I can read the signs of the times and the tendency of modern thinking, it is this. Either an absolute silence, a heaven stretching above us, blue and clear and cold and far away and dumb, or else a Christ that speaks, he or none. The theism that has shaken itself loose from him will be crushed. I am sure in the encounter with, the, with agnosticism and, with, and the materialism of this day, and the one refuge is to lay fast hold of the old truth, the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Oh, you orphan children that have forgotten your father and have turned prodigals and rebels, you that have begun to doubt if there is anyone above this low earth that cares for you, you that have got bewildered and befogged amidst the manifold denials and controversies of this day, come back to the one voice that speaks to us in tones of confident certainty and from personal knowledge of a father. He that has seen me, said Jesus, has seen the Father, says Jesus to us all. Hearken unto me and know God, who, whom to know me, or rather whom to know in me, is eternal life. Listen to him. Without his testimony, you will be the sport of fears and doubts and errors. With it in your hearts you will be at rest with God. Grace and peace come from the faithful witness whom Jesus is called in the opening of this verse. Point two, we have grace and peace from the conqueror of death. The first begotten from the dead does not pre precisely convey the idea of the original, which would be more accurately represented by the firstborn from the dead, the resurrection being looked upon as a kind of birth into a higher order of life. It is perhaps scarcely necessary to observe that the accuracy of this designation, the firstborn from the dead, as applied to our Lord, is not made questionable because of the mere fact that there were others who rose from the dead before his resurrection. For all of these died again. And here we're speaking about people such as Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, the young man who uh, was in an actual funeral procession and left his mother who was a widow with no one to support her. And Jesus stopped the funeral procession and raised him back to life. But all of those people, including Eutychus, who fell out of a third story window and Paul brought him back to life, and Dorcas, who Peter brought back to life, and others, all of those people were resurrected back to life, died again, unlike Jesus Christ. <clears throat> What a strange feeling that must have been for Lazarus and the others to go twice through the gates of death, twice to know the pain and the pang of separation. But these all have been gathered to the dust and lie now waiting the adoption that is the resurrection of the body. But this man, 
being raised, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. And how is it that grace and peace comes to us from the risen witness? Two or three words may be said about that. Think how, first of all, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the confirmation of his testimony. In it, the Father, to whom he hath borne witness in his life and death, bears witness to Christ that his claims were true and his work well-pleasing. He is, quote, declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, unquote. If our Lord did not rise from the dead, as all Christendom today has been declaring its faith that he did, then it seems to me that there's an end to his claims to be the Son of God and the Son of Man or anything other than, than a man like the rest of us. <clears throat> If he be no more naught else than a man, altogether like the rest of us, then there is an end to any special revelation of the divine nature, heart, purposes, and will in his works and character. They may still be beautiful. They may still reveal God in the same sense in which the doings of any good man success suggest a fontal source of goodness from which they flow. But beyond that, they're nothing. <clears throat> so all the truth and all the peace, all the grace and hope which flow to us from the witness of Jesus Christ to the Father, are neutralized and destroyed unless we believe in the resurrection from the dead. His words may still remain gracious and true in a measure, only all dashed with the terrible mistake that he asserted that he would rise again and rose not. But as for his life, it ceases to be in any real sense because it ceases to be in any unique sense, the revelation to the world of the character of God. And therefore, as I take it, it is no exaggeration to say that the whole fabric of Christianity and all Christ's worth as a witness to God, stand or fall with the fact of his resurrection. If you pull out that keystone, down comes the arch. There may be still a fair carving of some, on some of the fallen fragments, but it is no longer an arch that spans the great gulf and has a firm pier on the other side. Strike away the resurrection and you fatally Damage the witness of Jesus. You cannot strike the supernatural out of Christianity and keep the natural. The two are so inextricably woven together that to wrench away the one lacerates the other and makes it bleed even to death. If Christ be not risen, we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. Our preaching and your faith are alike vain. Ye are yet in your sins, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Grace and peace come from faith in the first begotten from the dead.
And that is true in another way, too. Faith in the resurrection gives us a living Lord to confide in. Not a dead Lord whose work we may look back upon with thankfulness, but a living one. One who works now upon us and by whose true companionship and real affection, strength, and help are granted to us every day. The cold frost of death has not congealed that stream of love that poured from his heart while he lived on earth. It flows yet for each of us, for all of us, for the whole world. And the violinist writes, the story of Jesus stands on the fact that he rose again. If he didn't rise, our faith is vain and he becomes one of the biggest frauds the world has ever seen. Well, I sort of agree with all of that, except for the fact that if he died and stayed dead, then, okay, you're right, he is the fraud because he kept on saying he would rise in three days. But then his disciples and the whole church are also frauds because they claim to be witnesses of his resurrection, of seeing him you know, resurrected. So the whole thing becomes a sham, starting with him and ending with the church. My brother, we cannot do without a living Christ to stand beside us to sympathize, to help, to love. We cannot do without a living Christ with whom we may speak, who will speak to us. And that communion, which is blessedness, that communication of power and righteousness, which is life, are only possible if it be true that his death was not the end of his relationship to us, or or of his work in the world, but was only a transition from one stage of that work to another. <clears throat> there is no middle ground, and he is quite correct. We have to look to Christ, the faithful witness, the witness who witnessed when he died. But we have to look to him that is risen again and takes his place at the right hand of God. And the grace and peace flow to us, not only from the contemplation of the past witness of the Lord, showered upon us from the open hands of the risen and living Christ. In still another way do grace and peace reach us from the first begotten from the dead, inasmuch as in him and in his resurrection, resurrection life, we are armed for victory over that foe whom he has conquered. If he be the firstborn, he will have many brethren. The first implies a second. He has been raised from the dead. Therefore, death is not the destruction of conscious life. He hath been raised from the dead. Therefore, any other man may be. Like another Samson, he has come forth from the prison house with the bars and gates upon his mighty shoulder and has carried them away up there to the hilltop where he is. And the prison house door stands gaping wide and none so weak, but he can pass out through the ever open portals. Christ has risen and therefore, if we will trust him, we have conquered that last and grimmest foe. And so, for ourselves, when we are trembling, as we all do with a natural shrinking of flesh from the thought of that certain death,
for ourselves in our hours of lonely sorrow when the tears come or the heart is numbed with pain, for ourselves when we lay ourselves down in our beds to die, grace and peace like the dove that fell on his sacred head as it rose from the water of baptism will come down from his hands who is not only the faithful witness but the first begotten from the dead. <clears throat> Number three, and lastly, we have grace and peace from the King of Kings. The series of aspects of Christ's work here is ranged in order of time in so far as the second follows the first and the third flows from both, though we are not supposed, though we are not to suppose that our Lord has ceased to be the faithful witness when he has ascended his sovereign throne. His own saying, I have declared thy name and will declare, from John 17, shows us that his witness is perpetual and carried on from his seat at the right hand of God. <clears throat> he is the prince of the kings of the earth just because he is the faithful witness. That is to say, his dominion is the dominion of the truth. His dominion is a kingdom over men's wills and spirits. Does he rule by force? No. Does he rule by outward mean? No. By terror? No. But because, as he said to the astonished Pilate, he came to bear witness to the truth. Therefore, he is the king not only of the, not of the Jews only, but of the whole world. A kingdom over heart and conscience will and spirit is the kingdom which Christ has founded and his rule rests upon his witness. And not only so, he is the prince of the kings of the earth because in that witness he dies and so becomes a martyr to the truth. The word in the original convey both ideas. That is to say, his dominion rests not only upon truth, that would be a dominion grand as compared with the kingdoms of, of this world, but still cold. His dominion rests upon love and sacrifice. And so his kingdom is a kingdom of blessing and of gentleness. And he is crowned with the crowns of the universe because he was first crowned with the crown of thorns. His first regal title was written upon his cross, and from the cross, his royalty ever flows. He is the king because he is the sacrifice. And he is the prince of the kings of the earth because witnessing and slain, he has risen again. His resurrection has been the step midway, as it were, between the humiliation of earth and death and the loftiness of the throne. By it, he has climbed to his place at the right hand of God. He is king and prince. Then, by right of truth, love, Sacrifice, death, and resurrection. <clears throat> and king to what end? That he may send grace and peace. Is there no peace for a man's heart in feeling that the brother that loves him and died for him 
rules over all the perplexities of life, the confusions of providence, the sorrows of the world, and the corruptions of his own nature? Is it not enough to drive away fears, to anodyne cares, to disentangle perplexities, to quiet disturbances, and to make the coward brave and the feeble strong, and the foolish wise and the querulous patient, to think that my Christ is King, and that the hands which were nailed to the cross wield the scepter, and that he who died for me rules the universe and rules me. <clears throat> oh, brethren, there is no tranquility for a man anywhere else but in the humble, hearty recognition of that Lord as his Lord. Crown him with your reverence with your loyal obedience, with your constant desires. Crown him with your love, the most precious of all the crowns that he wears. And you will find that grace and peace come to you from him. Such then is the vision that this seer in Patmos had of his Lord. It was to him a momentary opening of the heavens, which showed him his throne Lord. But the fact which was made visible to his inward eye for a moment is an eternal fact. Today as then, tomorrow as today, for Asiatic Greeks and for modern Englishmen, for past centuries, for the present, and for all the future, for the whole world forever, Jesus Christ is the only witness whose voice breaks the awful silence and tells us of a father, the only conqueror of death who makes the life beyond a firm certain fact, the king whose dominion it is, life to obey. <clears throat> and the violinist asks, why does the Catholic Church still insist on doing the holy sacrifice of the Mass, since in fact it is not needed because Christ was the sacrifice once for all? Sacrifices have since become obsolete since Christ's death on the cross for our sins. Well, in my experience, having been raised a Catholic, and in my experience of them, it is almost as if they went out of their way to find out what the Bible said to do and to not do and to undertake the opposite on both. And so, where the Bible speaks of, for example, turning our backs on him, as it says, turning, it back, turning our backs on him, as it says, to, to crucify him afresh to an open shame, you know, the idea of a, a renewed sacrifice is not something that the Bible talks about. Jesus certainly says <clears throat> to commemorate his death. Do this in memory of me. But not to call it a, a renewed sacrifice, which is offered daily. Now, under his wings asks to go against the Bible. Well, I'll put this in the simplest terms. Jesus spoke to his disciples in the context of religious titles that he did not want them to use. He said, call no man your master, 
for you have one master. Call you man. Call no man on earth your teacher, because you have one teacher, or rabbi, because you have one. And call no man your father on the earth, because you have a father who's in heaven. This is in the this is in the context of religious titles for the ministry. The church has to not only ignore that command. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have a human father. Certainly, he didn't. He didn't uh, uh, complain to anyone that they were sinning when they said, "Is is his father not the carpenter? Is this, is his father not Joseph?" We have a human father, but he said not to apply that term to a to a a clerical title like rabbi or master or or father. But the entire Catholic ministry are called father. That's their, their title. And the one who is the head of the Catholic Church, his title is the Holy Father. Well, there's, there's only one Holy Father. And he's never been in Rome. And if anyone finds that disagreeable or offensive, I did not mean to be such. But it's not me that you're upset with because I'm not the one that said it. Jesus said, call no man in the context of religious clerical titles, call no man father. And that's one of the first things that I came to learn as I was reading the word of God from my father's Catholic Bible. That I, I could not find anything Catholic in the Catholic Bible. I couldn't find their teachings there. And I'm sincere when I say I don't mean to offend anyone, but it's not me that's that you're upset with. <coughs> no, their Bible is their Bible is virtually identical to the King James Bible. Under his wings, writes uh, interesting that their Bible doesn't teach man-made doctrine. No, it doesn't. It teaches Christian doctrine. They just don't follow it. And like I said, it seems like they go out of their way to defy it, to do the opposite of what it says to do and not do. So that was Alexander McLaren continues. We all need him. Have wants which only his grace can supply. Your lives have trouble. Troubles, plural, which only his peace can still. <coughs> Sin and sorrow, change and trial, separation and death are facts in every man's experience. They are ranked against us in serried bat battalions. You can, you can conquer them all if you will seek shelter and strength from him who has died for you and lives to succor and to save. And under his wings writes, side note, it'll be interesting to see what the Pope does in the end times. Well, we're, we're mighty close to that, to seeing that, because I believe the end times are, I think the curtain is just now going up. The lights are going down and the curtain is going up. Alexander McLaren writes, trust him. Let your faith grasp the past fact of the cross whose virtue never grows old. And the present fact of the throne from which he bends down with hands full of grace. And on his lips, the tender old word, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Revelation 1, 5. 
We have here that great thought of the present love of Christ. The words seem to me to become especially beautiful if we remember that they come from the lips of him whose distinction it was that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, namely John. It's as if he had said, I share my privilege with you all. I was no nearer him than you may be. Every head may rest on the breast, on the breast where mine rested. Having the sweet remembrance of that early love, these things I write unto you, that ye also may have the fellowship with me in that which was my great distinction. I, the disciple whom Jesus loved, speak to you as the disciples whom Jesus loves. <clears throat> Mark that he is speaking of one who had been dead for half a century and that he is speaking to people, none of whom had probably ever seen Jesus in and most of whom had not been born when he died. Yet to them all he turns with that profound and mighty present tense and says, he loveth us. He was speaking to all generations and telling all the tribes of men of a love which is in active operation towards each of them. Not only at the moment when John spoke to Asiatic Greeks, but at the moment when we, Englishmen, read his words, Christ that loveth us. Now, Alexander McLaren was a Scottish living in the 1850s. He frequent references in his to England and things like that. But we could easily unplug the word Englishman and put in Americans or Germans or, or Italians or Frenchmen or Scandinavians or, or any other nationality as a present tense Christ that loveth us. Because, yes, he did die, but he's also the firstborn from the dead. Now, that great thought suggests two things. One as to the permanence, and one as to the sweep of Christ's love. Since we have here the revelation of one whose relation to life and death is altogether unique, for though we must believe that the dead do still cherish the love that lighted earth for them, we cannot suppose that their love embraces those whom on earth they did not know, or that for those who are still held in his grasp, it can be a potence in active operation to bless them and to do them good. <clears throat> But here is a man to the exercise of whose love, to the clearness of whose apprehension and knowledge, to the outgoing of whose warm affection, the active energy of that affection, life or death, make no difference. The cold which stays the flow of all other human love, like frost laid upon the running streams with binds and fetters has no power over the flow of Christ's love, which rolls on, unfrozen and unaffected by it. <clears throat> but not only, not only does Christ's love, Christ's present love require that he should be lifted above death as it affects the rest of us, but it also demands for its explanation that we shall see in him true divinity. For this loveth is the timeless present 
of that divine nature of which we cannot properly say either that it was or that it will be, but only that it is for, for that it forever is. And the ongoings of his love, the outgoings of that divine energy of which we cannot properly say that it did or that it will do, but only that it ever does. His love, if I might use such a phrase, is lifted above all tenses and transcends even the bounds of grammar. He did love, he does love, he will love. All three forms of speech must be combined in setting forth the ever-present because timeless and eternal love because timeless and eternal love of the incarnate word. <clears throat> then let me remind you too that this present love of Christ is undiminished by the glory to which he, to which he is exalted we find clear and great differences between the picture of Christ in the four Gospels and the picture of him drawn in that magnificent vision of this chapter, namely in the book of Revelation. The hand that holds the seven stars is as tender as when it was laid on little children or on lepers in cleansing or as when it held up the sinking apostle, or lifted the sick from their couches, or as when it was stretched on the cross and pierced with nails. And the face, which is as the sun shineth in his strength, is as gracious as when it beamed in pity upon wanderers and sorrowful ones, and drew by its beauty and its sweetness the harlots and the publicans to his pity. The exalted Christ loves as did the lowly Christ on earth. But here we have not only the present and permanent love, but we have the sweep and extent of it. He loveth us. And though John was speaking primarily about a little handful of people scattered through some of the seaboard towns of Asia Minor, the principle upon which he could make the assertion in regard to them warrants us in extending the assertion not only to men that respond to the love and believe in it, but right away over all the generations of successive files of the great army of humanity down to the very ends of time. He loveth us. <clears throat> That universality, wonderful as it is and requiring for its basis the same belief in Christ's divine nature, the present energy of his love requires, has to be translated by each of us into an individualizing which is poured upon each single soul as if it were the sole recipient of the fullness of the heart of Christ. When we extend our thoughts or our sympathies to a crowd, we lose the individual. <clears throat> we, 
we generalize, as logicians say, by neglecting the particular instances. That is to say, when we look at the forest, we do not see the trees. But Jesus Christ sees each tree, each stem, each branch, each leaf. Just as when the crowd thronged him and pressed him, he knew when the tremulous finger, wasted and shrunken to skin and bone, was timidly laid on the hem of his garment. As there was room for all the five thousand, and no man's plenty was secured at the expense of another man's penury, so each of us has a place in that heart. <clears throat> and my abundance will not starve you, nor your feeding full diminish the supplies for me. Christ loves all, not with the vague general philanthropy which men love the mass, but with the individualizing knowledge, special direction of affection towards the individual which demands for its fullness a divine nature to exercise it. And so each of us may have our own rainbow. To each of us, the sunbeam may come straight from the sun and strike upon our eye in a direct line. To each of us, the whole warmth of the orb may be conveyed. And each of us may say, He loveth me and gave himself for me. Is that your conception of your relation to Jesus Christ and of Christ to you? <clears throat> Notice the great proof and outcome of this present love. Because it is timeless love and has nothing to do with the distinction of past, present, and future, John lays hold of a past act as the manifestation of a present love. If we would understand what that love is, which is offered to each of us in the present, we must understand what is meant and what is involved in that past act to which John points. He loosed us from our sins by his own blood. Christ is the emancipator and the instrument by which he makes us free is his own blood. He loosed us from our sins by his own blood. <clears throat> That same blood which shed delivers, let me read that again. That same blood which shed delivers them that trust in Jesus from the guilt of their sin imparted to men, delivers them from the power of their sin. The blood is the life according to the simple physiology of the Old and of the New Testament. When we read in scripture that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, as I believe we're intended to understand that word, the impartation of Christ's life to us purifies our nature and makes us too in our degree and on condition of our own activity and gradually and successively free from all evil. <clears throat> so as regards both of the both aspects of the thraldom of sin, as guilt and as habit. He has loosed us from our sins <clears throat> in his own blood. That is the great token and manifestation of his love. If we do not believe that, how else can we have any real conviction and proof of anything worth calling love as being in the heart of Jesus Christ to any of us? To me, it seems that unless a man accepts that great thought, he loved me and gave himself for me, and is daily working in my nature to make it and me more like himself, 
he has no real proof that Jesus Christ cares a jot for him or knows anything about him. <clears throat> but I, for my part, venture to say that Looking on Christ and his past, as this text does, we can look up to Christ in the present, as the seer did, and behold and throne by the sides of the glory, the man, the incarnate word who loves with timeless love every single soul of man. That present love and that great past act, which is its vindication and manifestation, are the true glory of God. For his glory lies not in its attributes, we call them, that distinguish him from the limitations of humanity, such as omniscience and omnipresence and eternal being and the like. All these are great, but they're not the greatest. <clears throat> The divinest thing in God is his love. And the true glory is the glory that rays out from him when we, when we behold full of grace and truth, full of love and dying on the cross. And so, brethren, the question of questions for each of us is, is Jesus Christ my emancipator? Do I see him do I see in him he that looses me from my sins and makes me free? In him? Because the son has made me free and a son. Do I render to him the love which such a love requires? Do I find in him my ever-present lover and friend? And is his love to me as a stimulus for all service and amulet against every temptation, a breakwater in all storms, a light in every darkness, a pledge of a future heaven, and the beginning of a, of a heaven upon earth? I beseech you, recognize your fetters and do not say, we were never in bondage to any man. Recognize your liberator. Put your trust in him. <clears throat> and then you will be able to join here and more perfectly hereafter in that great storm and chorus of praise which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. And as you may have thought that I was just about to say, this concludes this evening's discussion. Christian Resolutions, Part 9. I hope you've come to see why I have such a high estimation of Alexander McLaren's writings. I think his commentary on that single verse may have, may have been the most powerful thing I've experienced from his writings yet. I mean, I just loved how he put everything together. I, I loved it. And I hope you did too. And I hope you were as, as blessed by hearing me read it as I was to read it and to, and to share it with you. So we have much more to speak about <clears throat> where the love of Christ is manifested toward us. As we examine love, the first fruit of the Spirit, 
And this will, under his wings, uh, says I will be listening to this later. It will be on YouTube. There will be a link to the YouTube channel in the notes on the forum, which will also be there so you can read it or listen to it again if you so choose. And I'm certainly uh, happy that both are available. And to the uh, to EYEI for uh, making that available. Well, thank you, everyone. I have uh, I'm going to be turning my mic off now. I'll be here for another minute if you'd like to discuss anything else. Thanks for your attendance. I hope.